Hello BookTube, and welcome back to a series of videos in which I am reading you a book. Barchester Towers by Anthony Trollope. Of course, I'm not just reading it. <laughs> I'm also nattering on about it. But I'll try to keep that under control, although you all seem to like it. Uh, we are up to Chapter 10, which is called Mrs. Proudy's Reception Commenced, meaning there's going to be more than one chapter about the uh, the reception. And the the ingredients are all now in place now for a novel instead of, uh, I don't know, a short story or even a premise. The, the old Bishop of Barchester has died, and a stranger has been put in his place. Not the old Bishop's son, but a stranger, and his bossy wife, and his oily, horrible, insinuating, domineering chaplain. And these newcomers, those three newcomers, want to remake Barchester Cathedral in their own image. They want to change the way things have been done for a hundred years and institute a, you know, a new regime. I don't think it really matters what the new regime is. It's, that's always going to be an affront to the old regime, especially to Dr. Grantley, the old bishop's son who wants to run the show and now recognizes in that oily chaplain, Mr. Slope, an essential adversary. Uh, and one of the little reforms that this new bishop wants to implement is that he doesn't want any more absentee clerics in his diocese. He doesn't want high officials in the church who are drawing a full salary but have never done a day's work there. Particularly, we are introduced to the worst offender, Dr. Vesey Stanhope, who for 20 years has lived on the shores of Lake Como. While his services are conducted in his own diocese, in his own church, in his own name, by his curates, by people he gives a fraction of his income to. Uh, the new bishop doesn't like that and sends out letters to all of those recreants, including Dr. Vesey Stanhope, saying, you'd better come back to Barchester for at least a little while. Uh, and that occasions Trollope uh, to describe the Stanhope family, which he does. He describes the Stanhope family. Not only the, uh, the, the good doctor and his wife, but also their children, <laughs> who are a weird bunch. There's uh, a cold, calculating, older sister. There's a younger sister who fancies herself an Italian countess, who <laughs> she's called, or she, Trollope takes to calling her semi-mockingly La Signora. Uh, and then there's the boy, there's Bertie, who is weird and feckless to the point of being an ostrich-plumed oddity. <laughs> and they're all, you're, you're meant to see, especially uh, Madeline and Bertie, especially La Signora and Bertie, you're meant to see them as hothouse flowers that could only flourish in Italy. They, can't, they would never have turned out that way in England, at least not the England in, in Anthony Trollope's mind. And all of a sudden, these oddballs, this, this Adams family, <laughs> are called back to the Barchester Close. And uh, now that they are part of the plot, uh, a, a, a kind of trollop story can finally start to happen. Instead of just, you know, we've got Dr. Grantley on one side and Mr. Slope on the other, uh, vying for control of a cathedral. That is a story. It's a fairly bloodless story, but it is a story. And is there anyone who doubts that Trollope can make that story interesting? He can make any story interesting, almost. <laughs> but, uh, but we expect more, and we're, we're going to start to get more. So here is chapter 10. Uh, the bishop and his wife had only spent three or four days in Barchester on the occasion of their first visit. His lordship had, as we have seen, taken his seat on his throne, but his demeanor there, into which it had been his intention to infuse much hierarchical dignity, had been a good deal disarranged by the audacity of his chaplain's sermon. Mr. Slope gives an incredible barn-burning sermon on his first try at bat from the, pro the pulpit of Barchester Cathedral, laying out uh, how all of the old ways are wrong and all of our new ways are going to be the, re the lay of the land. Uh, he ha had hardly dared to look his clergy in the face and to declare by the severity of his countenance that in truth he meant all that his factotum was saying on his behalf, nor yet had he dared to throw Mr. Slope over and show to those around him that he was no party to the sermon and would resent it. That would be the easy way here. It's kind of amazing to me that given what we what Trollope has told us about Mr. Prouty's personality, why he doesn't just do that? The obvious answer is because he can't. His wife loves Mr. Slope, so he can't he can't go against her. On his own, I think he would certainly jettison a troublesome priest in order to make nice with his new his new parish. But uh, anyway, <laughs> I'll try not to interject. I said uh, he had accordingly blessed his people 
in a shambling manner, not at all to his own satisfaction, and had walked back to his palace with his mind very doubtful as to what he would say to his chaplain on the subject. He did not remain long in doubt. He had hardly doffed his lawn when the partner of all his toils entered his study and exclaimed, even before she had seated herself, Bishop, did you ever hear a more sublime, more spirit-moving, more appropriate discourse than that? Well, my love, uh, you, you. <laughs> the bishop did not know what to say. I hope, my lord, you don't mean to say you disapprove. <laughs> there was a look about the lady's eye which did not admit of my lord's disapproving at that moment. <laughs> he, uh, he felt that he, if he intended to disapprove, it must be now or never, but he also felt that it could not be now. <laughs> it was not in him to say to the wife of his bosom that Mr. Slope's sermon was ill-timed, impertinent, and vexatious. No, no, replied the bishop. I, I, no, I can't say I disapprove. A very clever sermon and very well intended, and I dare say it will do a good deal of good. Uh, this last praise was added, seeing that he had already said by no means satisfied, Mrs. Proudie. I hope it will, said she. I am sure it was well deserved. Did you ever in your life, bishop, hear anything so play-acting as that way in which Mr. Harding sings the litany? I shall beg Mr. Slope to continue a course of sermons on the subject till all that is altered. We will have, at any rate, in our cathedral, a decent, godly, modest morning service. There must be no more play-acting here now. And so the lady rang for lunch. At last we know something of what her objection is. Uh, the bishop knew more about cathedrals and deans and presenters and church services than his wife did, and also more of a bishop's powers, but he thought it better at present to let the subject drop. My dear, said he, I think we must go back to London on Tuesday. I find my staying here will be very inconvenient to the government. The bishop knew that to this proposal his wife would not object, and he also felt that by thus retreating from the ground of battle, the heat of the fight might be got over in his absence. Mr. Slope will remain here, of course, said the lady. Oh, of course, said the bishop. Thus, after less than a week's sojourn in his palace, did the bishop fly from Barchester, nor did he return to it for two months, the London season being then over. During that time, Mr. Slope was not idle, but he did not again essay to preach in the cathedral. In answer to Mrs. Proudie's letters advising a course of sermons, he had pleaded that he would at any rate wish to put off such an undertaking till she were there to hear them. He had employed his time in consolidating a Proudie and Slope party, or rather a Slope and Proudie party, and he had not employed his time in vain. He did not meddle with the dean and the chapter, except by giving them little teasing intimations of the bishop's wishes about this and the bishop's feelings about that, in a manner which was to them sufficiently annoying, but which they could not resent. He preached once or twice in a small church in the suburbs of the city, but made no allusion to the cathedral service. He commenced the establishment of two Bishop's Barchester Sabbath Day schools, gave notice of a proposed Bishop's Barchester Young Men's Sabbath Evening Lecture Room, and wrote three or four letters to the manager of the Barchester Branch Railway, informing him how anxious the bishop was that Sunday trains should be discontinued. At the end of two months, however, the bishop and the lady reappeared and as a happy harbinger of their return, heralded their event by the promise of an evening party on the largest scale. The tickets of invitation were sent out from London. They were dated from Bruton Street and were dispatched by the odious Sabbath-breaking railway in a huge brown paper parcel to Mr. Slope. Everybody calling himself a gentleman or herself a lady within the city of Barchester and a circle of two miles round it was included. Tickets were sent out to all the diocesan clergy and also to many other persons of priestly note, of whose absence the bishop, or at least the bishop's wife, felt tolerably confident. It was intended, however, to be thronged and noticeable affair, and preparations were received were made for receiving some hundreds, hundreds of people. So we're talking a bash on the level of a lot of the big parties that we see in the palace novels. And now there arose considerable agitation among the Grantleys whether or not they would attend the Episcopal bidding. The first feeling with them all was to send the briefest excuses both for themselves and their wives and daughters, but by degrees policy prevailed over passion. The archdeacon perceived that he would be making a false step if he allowed the cathedral clergy to give the bishop just ground for umbrage. They all met in conclave and agreed to go. They would show that they were willing to respect the office, uh, much as they might dislike the man. They, all, they agreed to go. The old dean would crawl in, if it were but for half an hour. The chancellor, treasurer, archdeacon, prebendaries, and minor canons would all go and would all take their wives. Mr. Harding was especially bidden to do so, resolving in his heart to keep himself far removed from Mrs. Proudie. 
and Mrs. Bold was determined to go, though assured by her father there was no necessity for such a sacrifice on her part. When all Barchester was to be there, neither Eleanor nor Mary Bold understood why they should stay away. Had they not been invited separately? And had not a separate little note from the chaplain, couched in the most respectable, la respectable language, been enclosed with a huge Episcopal card? Because we've seen Mr. Slope has made inroads with the Mrs. Bolds. Uh, and the Stanhopes would be there, one and all. Even the lethargic mother would so far bestir herself on such an occasion. They had only just arrived. The card was at the residence waiting for them. No one in Barchester had seen them, and what better opportunity could they have of showing themselves to the Barchester world? Some few old friends, such as the archdeacon and his wife, had called, and had found the doctor and his eldest daughter, but the elite of the family were not yet known. The elite of the family being the two weird children. <laughs> uh, the father indeed wished in his heart to prevent the signora from accepting the bishop's invitation, but she herself had fully determined that she would accept it. If her father was ashamed of having a daughter carried into a bishop's palace, she had no such feeling. But that isn't what's giving her father shame. It's the way he knows she's going to behave. That's what gives him shame. Uh, indeed, I shall, she said. She had said to her sister, who had gently endeavored to dissuade her by saying the company would consist wholly of parsons and parsons' wives. Parsons, I suppose, are much the same as other men, if you strip them of their black coats. And as to their wives, I dare say they won't trouble me. You may tell Papa I don't at all mean to be left behind. Papa was told and felt that he could do nothing but yield. He also felt that it was useless for him now to be ashamed of his children. <laughs> such as they were, they had become such under his auspices. As he had made his bed, so he must he lie upon it. As he had sown his seed, so must he reap his corn. He did not indeed utter such reflections in such language, but such was the gist of his thoughts. It was not because Madeline was a cripple that he, shrank, that he shrank from seeing her make one of the bishop's guests, but because he knew she would practice her accustomed lures, behave herself in a way that could not fail of being distasteful to the propriety of Englishwomen. These things had annoyed but not shocked him in Italy. There they had shocked no one, but here in Barchester, here among his fellow parsons, he was ashamed they would soon be seen, that they should be seen. Such as had been his feelings, but he repressed them. What if his brother clergymen were shocked? They could not take from him his preferment because of the manner of his da married daughter were too free. La Signora Neroni had, at any rate, no fear that she would shock anybody. Her ambition was to create a sensation, to have a parson at her feet, seeing that the manhood of Barchester consisted mainly of parsons, and to send, if possible, every parson's wife home in a green fit of jealousy. She just wants to make trouble. Uh, none could be too old for her, and hardly any too young, none too sanctified, and none too worldly. She was quite prepared to entrap the bishop himself, and then turn up her nose at the bishop's wife. She did not doubt of success, for she had always succeeded. The one thing was absolutely necessary. She must secure an entire sofa. Yes, she can't move. She likes to be displayed on a sofa where she stays for the whole of the evening. What she does about bathroom breaks, I don't know. Maybe that's just the old person in me talking. Uh, the card sent to Dr. and Mrs. Stanhope and family had been so sent in an envelope having on the cover Mr. Slope's name. The Signora soon learned that Mrs. Proudy was not yet at the palace and that the chaplain was managing everything. It was much more in her line to apply to him than to the lady, and she accordingly wrote him the prettiest little billet in the world. In five lines, she explained everything, declared how impossible it was for her not to be desirous to make the acquaintance of such persons as the Bishop of Barchester and his wife, and, she might add, also of Mr. Slope, depicted her own grievous state, and concluded by being assured that Mrs. Proudy would forgive her extreme hardihood in petitioning to be allowed to be carried to a sofa. She then enclosed one of her beautiful cards. In return, she received a polite answer from Mr. Slope. A sofa should be kept in the large drawing room immediately at the top of the grand stairs, especially for her use. And now the day of the party had arrived. The bishop and his wife came down from town only on the morning of the eventful day, as beloved such great as behooved great people to do. But Mr. Slope had toiled day and night to see that everything should be in right order. There had been much to do. No company had been seen in the palace since heaven knows when. New furniture had re been required, new pots and pans, new cups and saucers, new dishes and plates. Mrs. Proudy had at first declared that she, would not con that she would condescend to nothing so vulgar as eating and drinking. But Mr. Slope had talked, or rather written her, out of the, the economy. Bishops should be given to hospitality, and hospitality meant eating and drinking. So supper was conceded. The guests, however, were to stand as they consumed it. <laughs> it's just, just awful. Mrs. Proudy, make, uh, if you're going to have a dinner... 
you seat your guests. You don't have them standing around eating them, or juggling plates. <laughs> but nope, she insists. Uh, there were four rooms opening into each other, and on the first floor of the house, which were denominated for uh, the drawing rooms, the reception room, and Mrs. Proudy's boudoir. In olden days, one of these had been Bishop Grantley's bedroom, and another among uh, and um, another his common sitting room and study. The present bishop, however, had been moved down into a back parlor and been given to understand that he could very well receive his clergy in the dining room should they arrive in too large a flock to be admitted into his small sanctum. He had been unwilling to yield, and after a short debate, had yielded. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Proudy's heart beat high as she inspected her suite of rooms. They were really very magnificent, or at least would be so by candlelight, and they had nevertheless been got up with commendable economy. Large rooms, when full of people and full of light, look well because they are large and are full and are light. Small rooms are those which require costly fittings and rich furniture. Mrs. Proudy knew this and made the most of it. She had therefore a huge gas lamp with a dozen burners hanging from each of the ceilings. People were to arrive at ten, supper was to last from twelve to one, and at half past one everybody was to be gone. Carriages were to come in at the gate of the town and depart at the gate outside. They were desired they were desired to take up a quarter before one, as it was managed excellently, and Mr. Slope was invaluable. At half past nine, the bishop and his wife and their three daughters entered the great reception room, and very grand and very solemn they were. Mr. Slope was downstairs, giving the last orders about the wine. He well understood that curates and country vicars with their belongings did not require so generous an, art an article as the dignitaries of the clothes. There is a useful gradation in such things, and Marsala, at twenty shillings a dozen, did very well for the exterior supplementary tables in the corner. So give the lesser guests the cheaper wine. Uh, Bishop, said the lady, as his lordship sat himself down, don't sit on that sofa, if you please. It is to be kept separate for a lady. The bishop jumped up and seated himself on a cane-bottomed chair. A lady, he inquired meekly. Do you mean one particular lady, my dear? Yes, Bishop, one particular lady, said his wife, disdaining to explain. She has got no legs, Papa, said the youngest daughter, tittering. No legs, said the Bishop, opening his eyes. Nonsense, Netta, what stuff you talk, said Olivia. She has got legs, but she can't use them. She has always been kept lying down, and three or four men carry her about everywhere. Laws, how odd, said Augusta, always carried about by four men? I'm sure I shouldn't like it. Am I right behind, Mama? I feel as, I, as if I were open. She turned her back uh, to her anxious parent, meaning, not, uh, am I sitting behind someone, but is the back of my dress okay? It feels like it's not. Uh, open, to be sure you are, said she, and a yard of petticoat strings hanging out. I don't know why I pay such high wages to Mrs. Richards, if she can't take the trouble to see whether or not you are fit to be looked at, said Mrs. Proudy, poked the strings here and there, and twitched the dress there, and gave her daughter a shove and a shake, and then pronounced it all right. These people aren't all they should be. Uh... But, rejoined the bishop, who was dying with curiosity about the mysterious lady at her legs, who is it that is to have the sofa? What's her name, Netta? A, a thundering rap at the front door interrupted the conversation. Mrs. Proudy stood up and shook herself gently and touched her cap on each side as she looked in the mirror. Each of the girls stood on tiptoe and then rearranged the bows on their bosoms, and Mr. Slope rushed up three stairs, three steps at a time. But who is it, Netta? whispered the bishop to his youngest daughter. La Signora Madeline Vesey Neroni, whispered back the daughter, and mind you, don't let anyone sit upon that sofa. La Signora Madeline Vinci Neroni, he gets the name wrong, uh, muttered to himself be the, the bewildered prelate. Uh, had he been told that the Begum of, uh, of Awad or had been there, or the Queen Pomara of the Western Isles, he could not have been more astonished. La Signora Madeline Vinci Neroni who, having no legs to stand on, had bespoken a sofa in his dining room. <laughs> who could she be? He, however, could not now make any further inquiry, as Dr. and Mrs. Stanhope were announced. They had been sent on out of the way a little before the time, in order that La Signoria uh, might have plenty of time to get herself conveniently packed into the carriage. So the parents come first, then the La Signora comes, na comes later. Uh, ostensibly for convenience sake, but you know she likes the spotlight. Uh, the bishop was all smiles for the prebendary's wife, and the bishop's wife was all smiled for the prebendary. Mr. Slope was presented, and was much delighted to make the acquaintance of one whom he had heard so much. The doctor bowed very low, and then looked as though he could not return the compliment as regarded Mr. Slope, of whom, indeed, he had heard nothing. The doctor, in spite of his long absence, knew an English gentleman when he saw him. 
<laughs> Mr. Slope makes an immediate negative impression on everyone except the ladies. Uh, and then the guests came in shoals. Mr. and Mrs. Quiverful and their three grown daughters, Mr. and Mrs. Chadwick and their three daughters, the burly chancellor and his wife and the and clerical son from Oxford, the meager little doctor without encumbrance, Mr. Harding and Eleanor and Miss Bold, the dean leaning on a gaunt spinster, his only child now living with him, a lady very learned in stones, ferns, plants, and vermin, who had written a book about petals. A wonderful woman in her way was Miss Trefoil. Mr. Finney, the attorney was, with his wife, was to be seen, much to the dismay of many who had never met him in a drawing room before. The five Barchester doctors were all there, and, the, and old Scalpin, the retired apothecary and tooth drawer, who was first taught to consider himself as belonging to the higher orders by the receipt of the bishop's card. He'd never been included before. You, you get the sense here that Mrs. Prouty is casting her net incredibly wide to have all of Barchester there. Uh, then came the archdeacon and his wife and their eldest daughter, Griselda, a slim, pale, retiring girl of 17 who kept close to her mother and looked out on the world with quiet, watchful eyes, one who gave promise of much beauty when time should have ripened it. And so the rooms became full, and knots were formed, and every newcomer paid his respects to my lord and passed on, not presuming to occupy too much of the great man's attention. The archdeacon shook hands very heartily with Dr. Stanhope, and Mrs. Grantley sh seated herself by the doctor's wife. And Mrs. Proudy moved uh, about with well-regulated grace, measuring out the quantity of her favors to the quality of her guests, just as Mr. Slope had been doing with the wine. But the sofa was still empty. And five and twenty ladies and five gentlemen had been courteously warned off it by the mindful chaplain. Why doesn't she come? said the bishop to himself. His mind was so preoccupied with the signora, he hardly remembered how to behave himself, as the bishop should do. <laughs> Already casting a spell on him. He hasn't even seen her yet. Uh, at last, a carriage dashed up the hall steps with a very different manner of approach from that of any other vehicle which had been there that evening. A perfect commotion took place. The doctor, who had heard it as he was standing in the drawing room, knew that his daughter was coming and retired into the furthest corner where he might not see her entrance. Mrs. Prouty jerked herself up, feeling that something impor of an important piece of business was in hand. The bishop was instinctively aware that La Signora Vinci Neroni had come at last, and Mr. Slope hurried into the hall to give his assistance. He was, however, nearly knocked down and trampled on by the cortege that he encountered on the hall steps. He got himself picked up as well as he could and followed the cortege upstairs. The Signora was carried head foremost, her head being the care of her brother and an Italian manservant who was accustomed to the work. Her feet were in the care of the lady's maids and the lady's Italian page, and Charlotte Stanhope followed to see that all was done with due grace and decorum. In this manner they climbed easily into the drawing room, and a broad way through the crowd having been opened, the signora rested safely on her couch. She had sent a servant beforehand to learn whether it was a right or left-hand sofa, for it required that she should dress accordingly, particularly as regards her bracelets. And a very becoming dress, uh, very becoming her dress was. <sighs> Here we get another long paragraph about uh, a signora. Trollope is clearly signaling that he's going to do a lot with this character. Uh, it was white velvet without any other garniture than rich white lace worked with pearls across her bosom and the same round the armlets of her dress. Across her brow she wore a band of red velvet on the center of which shone a magnificent cupid in mosaic, the tints of whose wings were the most lovely azure and the color of whose chubby cheeks was the clearest pink. On the one arm which she positioned, which her position required her to expose, she wore three magnificent bracelets, each of different stones. Beneath her, on a mantle or shawl, which went uh, under her whole body and concealed her feet, dressed as she was and looking as she did, so beautiful and yet so motionless, with the pure brilliancy of her white dress, brought out and strengthened by the color beneath it, with that lovely head and those large, bold, bright, staring eyes, it was impossible that either man or woman should do other than look at her. Neither man nor woman, for some minutes, did so other. Uh, her bearers were too were her bearers too were worthy of note. The three servants were Italian, and though perhaps not peculiar in their own country, they very much were so in the palace of Barchester. The man especially attracted notice and created a doubt in the minds of some whether he were a friend or a domestic. Same doubt as was felt as to Ethelbert. The man was attired in a loose-fitting common black morning coat. He had a jaunty, fat, well-pleased face on which no atom of beard appeared and he wore round his neck a loose black silk neck handkerchief. 
The bishop essayed to make him a bow, but the man, who was well-trained, took no notice of him, and walked out of the room quite at his ease, followed by the woman and the boy. Ethelbert Stanhope was dressed in light blue from head to toe. He had on the loosest possible blue coat, cut square like a shooting coat, and very short. It was lined with silk of azure blue. He had on a blue satin waistcoat, a blue neck handkerchief, which was fastened beneath his throat with a coral ring, and very loose blue trousers, which almost concealed his feet. His soft, glossy beard was softer and more glossy than ever. He's all in blue. <laughs> it's a freak show to look at. Uh, the bishop, who had who had made one mistake, thought that he was also that he was also a servant, and therefore tried to make way for him to pass. But Ethelbert uh, soon corrected the error. Uh, so that is that is chapter ten, and that is the arrival, basically the arrival of the Stanhope family at this big party, this big reception that Mrs. Prouty is holding for all of Barchester, uh, because they're a little odd. <laughs> I mean, the doctor and Mrs. Stanhope know, and the oldest daughter know, but the two luminaries, the two the two freak shows, La Signora and also Ethelbert Bertie she has to be carried in by servants and laid, displayed on a couch where she will not move for the rest of the evening. And he is dressed all in blue, all in bright blue in this, in this normal gathering. Uh, he's wearing weird clothing and doesn't seem to care what anybody will think of that. Uh, so that, that is part one of Mrs. Prouty's reception. Now, we're going to get on to the finish of it next time. Uh, but anyway, that's gone quite long enough. That is our next chapter of Barchester Towers. I'll wrap this up for here, and we will continue next time. <laughs> Thank you, Book 2.